Hello and welcome to another episode of Be the Love to Awaken Our Souls. Thank you again so much for tuning in this week. I'm Stacey Musial. And I am Brenda Carey with our special guest, Naomi Slater. We are your co-hosts and souls on the journey, and we are on a mission to raise the consciousness of humans and the planet, and we need your help. Please spread the word to your family and friends and join us every week. Consider becoming a Patreon supporter or a sponsor to help with the operating costs like editing and the many hours we spend creating these shows with quality guests and content. And if you have resonated with our mission, support us in a way that raises your vibration to love. And if it feels safe for you, I'd like to begin by inviting you to take a moment and get centered with us. I'd like to begin by inviting you to take a beautiful cleansing breath in through your nose and out through your mouth, releasing anything that is keeping you from being present. And take another deep breath in through your nose. Breathing in calm, peaceful, loving energy and breathing out anything you're ready to release in this now moment. And take one more breath in through your nose, breathing in light and love for yourself. And imagine breathing that light and love and send it back to all of humanity, remembering that you always, always have your breath to come back to. Our guest today is Naomi Slater. She is an experienced sex and relationship coach, yoga teacher, and bioenergy therapist. She is the creator of the three-month online course, Awaken Your Desire, that helps women reclaim their wild and powerful divine feminine through the yoni egg practices, emotional alchemy, meditation, and psychoanalytic tools. Naomi is the host on the Divine Couples podcast, where she explores conscious sexuality through monologues and guest interviews. She holds an MA in Conflict Management and Resolution and a BA in Psychology and studied esoteric practices, treatments, and philosophies with various gurus worldwide. Naomi's passion is helping others reclaim their power, pleasure, and passion. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about our conversation. So tell us a little bit about your journey and just what has led you down this spiritual path. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to to share that. So I guess you could say my journey started about 20 years ago as a yoga student. And I traveled India pretty extensively. I was living in ashrams and studying with some pretty amazing uh, yogic masters. And at the time, I didn't realize that I was being actually exposed to tantra, tantric rituals, tantric philosophy. So yoga is actually a part of tantra. And, um, and I had some very, very deep spiritual awakenings through those practices, um, which have essentially led me through the majority of my life. Um, but if I were to fast forward many years later, I discovered tantra after I, after I was already married with two kids and was feeling frustrated. I had no libido. Um, I was rejecting my partner, even though I loved him and was still attracted to him. And we both realized that something needed to change in our relationship. And we we discovered the, the sexual aspect of Tantra and began doing those practices. And we really, really changed ourselves on a very fundamental level sexually. Um, but of course, when we change as sexual beings, it affects every aspect of our lives. So uh, we found ourselves um, living a different life in many ways, you know, reconnecting and learning to communicate differently and exploring our sexuality in deeper ways and becoming more vulnerable and being more authentic. And it was really through our uh, journey and through our own healing that I dedicated my life to doing this work. Mm, thank you for for sharing a little bit about your story and what led you down this path. and. Just as a, um, as a, for our listeners who might not understand or might not, you know, because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings around Tantra and how, you know, this is, especially in the Western world, right? And it's all, it's been, you know, a lot of it's based around sex and, mm -hmm. and so, and I know that's, that's part of it. I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners a little bit more about what Tantra is and the different facets that it also yeah. includes. 
Yeah. So uh, like you said, um, the, the way that the Western world has kind of understood Tantra is a bit skewed. And the reason for that is because Tantra is actually a very wide philosophy that if I were to kind of summarize what Tantra is about, it's about recognizing that everything in our lives is divine. So the good, the bad, the ugly, the joyous, the beautiful, all of it is an expression of divinity. And what that means is that there's no aspect of the human existence that needs to be negated. So the more that we're able to essentially you know, dive deeper into ourselves and recognize our human nature for what it is. So really, really tapping deeply into what it means to be human and not negating any of our experiences and labeling them as something that um, is bad, right? So once we're able to really, really see all of ourselves, you know, the, the, the depths of what it is to be human, um, that's, that's really what helps us understand in a deeper way what Tantra is. Now, the sexual aspect of Tantra was traditionally reserved for advanced students. And that is because our sexual energy is something that is fragile, very powerful, of course, but can be man manipulated and misused. So it was in order to really protect um, people from misusing this energy. Now, having said that, sexual energy is something that we can use to attain enlightenment, meaning we can use, to, we can use our sexual energy to awaken our consciousness. And if we use it in the right way, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool for awakening. Thank you for that clarification. I think that's important because I think there is a lot of misunderstandings uh, with what Tantra truly is. And I'm curious, what does it mean to be a Tantra coach? Like what, yeah. what do you do in that role? Yeah, so I do lots of things. Um, as a part of my course for women, I do, um, I, I really help women tap into themselves emotionally and sexually and help them process a lot of emotions that are oftentimes repressed. And our emotional world and our, our, you know, being sexual beings, these two things are very connected. So if we have lots of repressed emotions, um, that's going to affect how we are sexually. So that's, that's one of the main things that I do is I help people process emotion. I help people, um, first of all, identify their emotions. So a lot of people don't even know what it is they feel. Then, of course, we have to value what it is we feel. And then we have to be able to communicate those feelings. So there's kind of a process that I walk people through when it comes to uh, helping them recognize their emotions and also seeing how their emotions affect their sexuality, but not only. So, you know, our emotions affect our everyday life. But of course, our sexuality is something so primal, so basic. And when we start to awaken that, um, our emotions have a tendency to start kind of flushing through our body. People get surprised and all of a sudden they feel this anger or they want to laugh hysterically or, you know, they, they have these kind of cathartic moments. And it's because our sexuality and our emotions are very, very connected. So that's one bit of what I do. I also work a lot on communication. Um so again, this comes back to, be able to being able to identify our emotions, value them, and then communicate them. Um, and beyond that, I do a tremendous amount of embodiment work. So it's really nice to be able to coach people and talk to people and explain them things. But at the end of the day, what I believe is that if we're not working with our bodies, if we're not moving energy, then we're not going to get perhaps as far as we would have liked to get in terms of our own spiritual development. So I do a lot of embodiment work. So that can be with uh, using the yoni egg. This is a, a yoni egg. This is a, a pure nephrite jade egg that women do exercises with. They insert this into their uh, vulva or yoni, which is the Sanskrit term for vulva. And do various exercises which have physical, spiritual, mental benefits um, but it's done in a very conscious way. So not just, they're not just Kegel exercises. You're not just doing the physical. It's, it's much deeper than that. 
Um, and of course, meditations using breath and sound and, and lots of other tools um, that I work with to help people connect deeply to themselves. Hmm. That sounds so incredible and healing for so many people because, um, you know, I think there's so many people that are cut off from their emotions, like you said, right? We don't know what we're feeling. And then, you know, to be able to awaken those emotions and how that really would mirror into the sexual energy. And so I'm, I would love to talk a little bit more about that piece of the emotional energy. And, and what do you mean, like, as we awaken the sexual energy, how that is helping to awaken us, um, maybe to the path of enlightenment? Yeah. Yeah. So repressed emotions are not just in the mind. So a lot of people think that their emotions are only in their mind, but they're actually also in our body. And these emotions, if we don't process them, they get trapped in our body and different organs and prevent energy from flowing through us. So as long as we have these emotions or traumas, yeah, trapped in our body, we're essentially limiting the flow of energy. And when we're limiting the flow of energy, we're limiting our capacity to awaken, to evolve, and to really fulfill our destiny. So we all have a destiny in this, in this you know, uh, birth of ours, living on this planet. And if we're blocked, we're not going to be able to really fulfill our destiny. So to me, it's really about helping people be who they are through helping them learn to channel their own energy, through helping them learn to unblock themselves emotionally. And I'm curious too, if you can go into maybe some of the tools you might use to, to help that um, unblocking process. And what does that, what's that process look like? Yeah, so again, it, it comes down to embodiment work. Um, which oftentimes leads to triggering. So uh, not everybody wants to be triggered, but that's really a part of moving, you know, stuck energy. So we, we get triggered. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation perhaps where we're doing this work and we have some really, really deep resistance. Okay, there's, we don't want to do it or we don't have the time or, uh, you know, our mind takes over and instead of, really trying to stay present in our bodies. We're thinking about all of the things that we have to do. So we, we have to really use lots of different tools in order to create presence. So presence is really what we're looking after. So once, once we're present, we can have some very, very deep and profound spiritual experiences. So the tools that I use to help people create presence are, of course, sound, very basic things, creating sound, so a lot of people, when they make love, they're too ashamed to make sound. And sound is a tool that both helps us open up our genitals, but also helps us stay present. It helps us release energy. So it has a number of functions, but sound is really important in order to create presence. Of course, breath. So learning how to breathe properly, following your breath. Well, these are things that are really important uh, in order to create some deep presence. Movement. Yeah, so, you know, some women think that if they just lie in bed and, you know, allow for their man to do what they think will make them feel good, but they're kind of like lying there like dead fish, they probably won't get that turned on. So we need to be active in moving our body, both in the act of lovemaking and in general. We need to move. Our bodies are made for movement. So these are just some of the tools that I use uh, to help people connect to themselves deeply, which of course then creates more presence, which is what we want. I love that idea of using the different tools for full presence. And I think that's something that we can all that we can all use in our very busy, chaotic sometimes <laughs> world is that really deep presence. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious where, like, where does shame come in, especially when we talk about different sexual practices or things to awaken um, our, what, what I would call like Shakti energy? Um, mm. What, like, where do we recognize 
shame because I I think that can be very subconscious. Uh, and so I'm curious, like with either yourself or your clients, like where do you recognize that? And then what are some um, either tools or awarenesses that you bring to people that, oh, this this is shame? Hmm. Yeah. So I think, first of all, it's examining the way that we were raised, because oftentimes our childhood creates these patterns of shame for us. And if we go back into the messages that we received from our parents, perhaps, you know, were they open with us uh, in terms of talking about sexuality with us? Or were they, you know, really um, secretive and not really giving us very much information? Um, what was our religion? What were the messages we were receiving from religion around sexuality? Were those messages um, also kind of, you know, portray portraying sexuality in this kind of uh, dirty, make us feel guilty, uh, something that we should be shameful about. So if we receive this programming as children, it's very likely that we still have that programming today, unless we've done some sort of work to really move past that. So the way that it can surface is in all sorts of limiting beliefs that we have around our sexuality. So ideas about what we think we should and shouldn't do. Yeah. So if you have really, really firm ideas about what is allowed and what is not allowed, um, you know, how should I appear, um, you know, this will make me look slutty or this I shouldn't do or I shouldn't say this or if I say this, maybe um, it'll be perceived in this way. So if we have all of these conceptions and patterns and ideas around what we shouldn't and should do then there's very likely some patterning there, which we all have. We can't, we can't get away from it. We were all born into this world, into a culture, likely into a religion. So for the majority of people, this is something that's present, unless they've done some deep work. Yeah, I think shame is one of those things that there, it's, it's, Kind of embedded in our culture um and and whether it goes from you know this really like hiding oneself you know to the other side of you know being maybe over sexual and you know what's what's expected and and so trying to find that balance um and and coming back into um our bodies really and and why we're you know maybe believing or, or how we're holding that energy and then moving that energy. Um, so coming back to that awareness and presence. And, you know, kind of wanted to talk to you about um, sensuality. So sensuality is a big, you know, part of Tantra um, in my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And so how does sensuality play into the work that you do and, and mm. um, teaching women to be in their bodies? Oh, I love that question. Yeah. Sensuality, I think, especially when talking to women, females, is what's important for, for women to understand is that it starts with them, our sensuality. It's an energy that we, that we essentially have and we don't need a partner necessarily to trigger our own sensuality and sexuality. We can be sensual with ourselves. And when we start to learn how to essentially turn ourselves on, then we become way more magnetic to the opposite sex. So it's first teaching, teaching people how to, and not only women, also men, but teaching people how to connect to their, to their, sensual side with their own selves. So, so again, you know, if, if people are looking outward and thinking that someone else is constantly going to turn them on, what they're doing is they're giving away their power. Mm -hmm. And if we want to really be um, living in an embodied, passionate, powerful life with meaning and purpose, we need to learn how to turn ourselves on. We are sensual with no one else around. We can be sensual with ourselves. And, and that's actually something that I've encountered. There's a lot of shame around that. So getting women sometimes to dance in front of the mirror 
with their own. So nobody's there to witness it. It's just them. To, to dance, to kind of seduce themselves in front of the mirror, for a lot of women, that's really challenging. Mm. So it's kind of breaking down those barriers to awakening our own sexuality and sensuality first and foremost with ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Can you go into a little bit more detail about even, even what sensuality can look like for mm. people? Yeah, I think first of all, it's feeling in love with yourself, feeling energized in your own body, feeling turned on um, just by thinking a thought sometimes or by watching a sunset. Um, it's, it's really living an orgasmic life. And it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, I, when I say that, you know, your, your association might go straight to the bedroom, but I don't necessarily mean that. When I say living an orgasmic life, it means that you're turned on by your life, whatever's in your life. So mm -hmm. it can be the nature surrounding you. It can be this delicious meal that you've made for yourself. It can be um, this connection that you have with a friend where when, when you're with them, you feel turned on. Mm -hmm. You feel, you know, lit up. So it's feeling that in all areas of your life. And when you start to work on your sexuality, because that is that is the base of that energy. Our sexual energy and our life force energy are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So when we start to work with that energy, then we can feel lit up in many other areas of our life. Mm -hmm. I love that you use the word lit up because I, I do find that with... I work with a lot of women in the Ayurvedic health uh, spectrum. And oftentimes I'm like, well, what do you really desire? Like what, what lights you up these days? <laughs> and, and uh, I love asking that question. And I always think, oh, but for some women that's kind of been turned off because yeah. they're like, well, I've got all these things to do and these people to take care of. And it becomes mm. like the check it off the, the list. And I'm like, okay, well, that's the human doing things. But like, what do you really like truly enjoy? Like if time weren't an issue or money weren't an issue, because those barriers always seem to come up. Um, like what are, what lights you up? And I think that's, I don't know, probably I would love to hear your perspective. Like if you hear someone that they're just kind of like, just kind of flat or just kind of monotone, um, mm -hmm. how does the tantric practice kind of just help someone get into that space? Because uh, I do feel like for some women, they've, like you mentioned, given away their power mm -hmm. into well-meaningful things, whether that's children yeah. or work obligations or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, how can we, as women with very full plates, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, have that balance of having things that light us up and still, you know, be in the world as we need to taking care of the things that need to be taken care of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this question lights me up <laughs> because because I am a mother of three um I dedicated so much of my energy and time to raising my kids. And at a certain point, I realized that if I don't invest in myself, if I don't start giving back to myself, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. So I essentially learned that I needed to prioritize me also. I can't just be give, 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 checking everything else that I have to do off the list because that's not going to light me up. I need to also be doing for myself so so yeah it's really about encouraging women to do things for themselves so it's not just checking off all of the boxes you know the, the 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 things that we have to do in order to be responsible citizens and parents and partners and whatever else we are employees yeah what is it I really desire and making that happen for yourself you know so so many of our of our, um, the things that are, you know, we, we have so many things that are holding us back, but so many of those things are really in our mind. They're just constructs in our mind. It's because we're not flexible enough to understand that, that we can make other things happen for ourselves too. We just have to learn how to manifest. So some of the tools, right? You ask, so how do we, how do we get people to actually do that? Um, Yoga is a very powerful tool. 
So we, we need to have a sound body and mind if we're going to really be able to give back to ourselves. We need to have a full plate. And yoga is an incredible tool for really getting our body, mind, and spirit balanced. So yoga, as is tantra, I mean, it's, it's a tool that will help us reach higher states of, of evolution and consciousness. So even though yoga is, is physical, we're doing lots of physical things, breath work, asanas, you know, different postures. The point of that is not just to have a hot body. You know, this is not just going to the gym. The point is to really get our body and our mind and our spirit in shape so that we can continue to evolve. Mm. So if we're neglecting ourselves, both in terms of our body, if we're neglecting our mental health, if we're neglecting our diet, you know, if we're eating junk food. So it's going to be very hot, hard for us to feel lit up. So these are just kind of some basic, basic things mm. um, that we need to be looking out for. Are we taking care of our body? Are we taking care of our mind? Are we doing what makes us feel good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I think it's, yeah, that cultural conditioning, right, to be able to take care of ourselves and not not give so much. And, you know, there's there's that balance, right? And then we also get to receive from ourselves. So, so that kind of makes me think of, you know, that masculine feminine dance that we have within ourselves and also in our relationships you know if you're in a male you know the you know masculine feminine energies you know um i think that's present in all relationships but like because we all have that right within our 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 being is that internal masculine and feminine energy um and so but being able to open up and receive and i think that's really hard for a lot of people especially women right and so mm -hmm. so our would you say um or what are some practices to really you know maybe surrender into that receivership because i think that's a very feminine quality it and is. so to be able to open up and allow that that energy to come in yeah, that's that's beautiful. And I you've touched on something really important is that the, the main one of the main feminine qualities is uh, receptivity, is surrender, is opening ourselves up in in order to receive into us. This is also how, of course, women make love. You know, we have to open ourselves up in order to receive. And a lot of women have forgotten how to do this, and they're they're not at fault. It's just that we've been living in a very masculine society for thousands of years. So women have kind of been trained to step into the world in a masculine energy because that's how they think they're going to succeed. That's how they think, um, you know, that's how they feel like they're being, ex they're being expected to show up in that way. Mm. But really it's, it's, it's not natural for women to be in that energy all of the time. So yes, of course, women do have masculine traits. We do have, um, you know, we, we can have this kind of go get it uh, attitude and we can have uh, a, a desire to be successful and to make money and, and to do all of these things that are perhaps maybe considered to be more masculine. The question is, how do we do them? With what energy? And when we're able to really surrender and open our heart more we learn that we can actually magnetize towards us what it is we want to receive so the way of the male is you know they have erect <laughs> lingams or penis penises right so that's kind of the way in which they go out into the world but we receive we we pull towards us we pull inward so this is the female energy. And the more that we learn how to embody this also in our sexuality, the more it'll help us kind of in our lives. Now, I'm saying that with a but. Because a lot of women have another pattern, which is very, very problematic, which is they have no boundaries. If someone has no boundaries and they're in constant surrender, that's going to lead to trauma. 
So this surrender, this opening up of the feminine has to be with fierce boundaries. Mm -hmm. These two things actually go together. They sound kind of contradictory, but they actually go together beautifully. When a woman has fierce boundaries and she knows what she wants and what she doesn't want, then she's really actually able to surrender and to open up. She feels safe. She can be more vulnerable. Yeah, I love that. One. Fierce <laughs> boundaries. I'm, I'm going to take that from you at some point. I like that. <laughs> fierce boundaries. Because it is very true. Like we have to know what we want. And if that isn't defined in mm -hmm. a way that is authentic to us. And then I'm wondering... Do you think that this is why we're seeing a lot of burnout? Because I'm seeing that and I've experienced that earlier this year. And then also mm -hmm. with women that are coming to me, it's it's this combination. Sometimes the burnout is from, you know, the probably the no boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of and an overly masculine do 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 make the thing happen. And so that leads to bound or to burnout. So I can see where both of those do need to complement one another. And for me, I guess I see it in terms of it's resulting in burnout. How, I guess, how, how would you see it? Or do you see it in a similar pattern? Yes, I think that's right on. Absolutely. I think uh, it leads to burnout is actually um, the least of our worries. Mm. And oftentimes, if the, these patterns continue over time, they lead to sickness. Uh, unfortunately, I, I experienced that. So I, I was really struggling with my health for a while because I had no boundaries and I was getting sucked energetically and I didn't realize. So a lot of our, our health issues, sicknesses, a lot of they, a lot of these things come from um you know, repressed emotion, lack of boundaries, um, and really not investing in our own selves. Mm. So yeah, yeah. If, if you're feeling uh, deep burnout, then yeah, you should definitely understand a bit uh, more deeply, you know, what, it, what are your boundaries? Do you have boundaries? If you know what your boundaries are, do you know how to enforce them? And if you don't know what your boundaries are, then you should definitely learn how to understand somatically in your body what your boundaries are. So and how boundaries... would one do that? I, I'm really, mm -hmm. this is exciting to me because I'm also a yoga teacher. So how mm -hmm. would somatically, how would you take that on um, at, at boundaries in a somatic manner? Yeah. So, so first I'm just going to back up a bit and say that a lot of people, you know, their boundaries are in their mind. Right. So these right. are boundaries that we might have because of the way that we are raised, kind of going back to limiting beliefs that we might have. You know, you should do this. You shouldn't do that. These are the kind of boundaries that a lot of people have. It's in their mind. And those boundaries are not always self-serving. Sometimes they're destructive. So it can be a bit misleading. When I say what what are our boundaries somatically, it's learning how to tap into our body and really feel our yes and no somatically in our body. Mm. So what does that mean? Just to kind of give you a, a brief example. This is kind of getting into my course a bit. But um, so if I were to say to you, Brenda, um, can I come over and cook you the meal that you would love, your favorite food, you know, wh whatever it is you like, can I come over and cook you that meal? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like, and I felt and, that in my heart. I was like, yes. there you go. There you go. <laughs> so it's yes. listening. It's I can give exactly. up cooking. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So you, you, you were a perfect, a perfect subject for this. You said, I felt it in my heart. Mm -hmm. So you said yes to something and you felt it in your body. You felt perhaps an expansion of your heart, maybe the sense of peace or relaxation when you answered yes. I'm going to now ask you another question and you have to say yes. Okay. Okay. And we'll see how this goes. Brenda, can I be really nasty to you and make fun of you and say mean things to you? Yes. Oh. And you know what the yeah. weird thing is? My stomach <laughs> just went, 
grr, and it Ugh. like tightened up. Like I literally heard it just like gurgle really hard and like I tightened up. And I was like, yeah, that's probably why I have digestive issues. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So we do that all the time. You know, people will ask us to do something that we don't want to do. And we're, we say yes, because we want people to like us. We want to be right. a people pleaser. We think it's the right thing to do, right? So I, I, you know, the example that I threw at you now was pretty extreme, but it was just for the purpose of really understanding what it is to be a full body yes and what it is to be a full body no. So noticing what you felt when you answered. So when you were a full body yes, you felt this expansion kind of joy in your heart. And when you said yes, but you were actually a no, you felt something in your stomach kind of go, like, this is yeah. not what I want. Mm. So I that's felt what that. We, <laughs> <laughs> we need to start listening to that. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And trusting, right? Trusting in our own wisdom, our own body's wisdom, because our bodies are our barometer. I mean, it'll show up. And, you know, when we get really quiet and present with that, rather than thinking from the mind, right? I think that's where the mind starts to run and say, oh, well, I should say yes, you know, because, yeah, I don't want to hurt this person or, you know, I'm, you know, just that's my my uh, pattern, right? And that's what I've always done. So, but the body, the body will give you the answers. And so, so what is your, um, what are some of the things like, you know, so listening, so those are pretty clear because we're being really present, but are there practices you have that teach people to really get quiet with that voice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one practice that I do with women is called a yoni consciousness practice. And that practice helps women connect to their voice, the voice of their yoni or vulva. Sounds a bit strange, I know, but she actually has a tremendous amount of wisdom that she can impart upon us if we are, you know, if we're open to connecting with her and, and really listening to her. She can tell us what she likes, what she doesn't like, what she needs to heal, what she needs from us. She even has a name. <laughs> so so yeah so once we're open to to really deeply listening we can get a lot of information for our own healing mm. I love that. I love that I I have kind of well to kind of piggyback a little bit onto that when we were doing like the that what I would call absolute yes or no and then some of these practices what if it's an example that's maybe not quite so extreme like what if it's uh say someone they have a work project they were asked to do they don't really want to do it but they realize mm -hmm. that you know this might be beneficial to my career how does one navigate i guess being confrontational in a way because i think that's really at least for me and i know some of the other women that i work with like being that like holding your own and being confrontational and actually saying your no when you mm -hmm. want to without that perception of I don't know, not being a team player or not being the good mom, quote unquote, you know, whatever that might be. Like, how does one navigate that with those more subtle, like it's, eh, it could be a maybe, mm -hmm. but how, how can we get it really into that feeling? Yes. Or feeling no. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does actually. So um, the way that I teach is a maybe is usually a no. So if we're yeah. a maybe, where maybe that's that's a no and if you were to wait a bit longer before actually answering so if you don't if you feel like a maybe then you shouldn't answer you should wait and pause and breathe until you feel more solid in your answer because usually that maybe will 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 move over into a no now in terms of you know stating our boundaries and the perceptions that we might receive coming back. So that's that's some deep work that I had to do around not caring so much about what mm -hmm. other people think. Because if this is if this is really my authentic self, you know, then 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 that's 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 what I want to achieve, you know. And if that person doesn't like me because I'm in my authentic self, then maybe that's not somebody that I want to really be in communication with. 
Um, I realize that this can get more more difficult with, uh, you know, when you're an employee and you have a boss over your head and you have to, you know, do what they say. Um, but I've been in those those situations where I finally was able to stand my ground and say, no, this is not something that I'm willing to do. And I'm willing to to stand behind the consequences, whatever they may be. You know, whether it's them saying, well, okay, you know, we, we still want you. <laughs> or uh, them saying, well, maybe this is not going to work out. And me being willing to, to say, okay, yeah, okay, maybe it's not going to work out then. Mm. So yeah. it's not being so bothered by other people's perceptions. Mm. Yeah, and being true to yourself, and and so and and sometimes I, I found too just listening to that yes and that no that you know when I say no to something, even though it, my mind can't quite understand why I'm saying no, it usually benefits everybody because yeah. there's an intuition that is that is really yes. flowing with that. So. And I don't know why it is in the moment, but it, it usually turns out to be, you know, the answers start to unfold a little bit mm -hmm. more. So I think that's an important piece to look at as well. Yeah, I think I think so many women are connected to this. You know, women have such deep intuition, but we've been taught to override our intuition. Yes. So mm -hmm. this is going back to what is ours. You know, this is a, a gift that women have is our intuition, our ability, our ability to feel into things without our mind interfering and listening to our intuition. And mm -hmm. yes, Brenda, that can create digestive issues. I was yes. struggling with that. Me too. I was struggling. <laughs> yeah. And it's because I wasn't listening to my intuition. Mm -hmm. It's because I was allowing for my energy to get sucked out into all sorts of places where it didn't need to be going. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've come on the other side, not that I've totally resolved all digestive issues, but now actually my digestion is my best communicator. Like when things mm. are out of alignment, my digestion is almost the first thing before my mind can even pick up on it. My digestion just starts getting really out of balance. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Good. So now You're I look listening. at it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it took me, I mean, quite a few years to get to that point where I didn't think like I was a victim of the digestive pain, but mm -hmm. now it's like, okay, digestion's off. What's, what needs to be addressed in, in life personally or within the relationships that I have. So now I use it as like a messenger. Amazing. And it's, it actually can serve me when I do some inner work and take that time, like just allowing myself that time to do that. And I think for many women, it's, you know, know that we deserve the time mm -hmm. to take care of ourselves in, in a very deep way. Agreed. Um, yeah. So um, as we begin to wrap up our conversation, and as you focus on your work in, in the world, uh, how do you see this truly supporting like the bigger picture of healing, like in the mm. planet, like what's your macro vision um, for the work that you do? Yeah, well, my, my macro vision is, uh, of course, for people to accelerate their awakening and reach higher states of consciousness so that we can heal as a collective. And my, my of course, my personal take on that is once we start to understand the power of our sexual energy, we realize that we can use that energy for healing, for healing ourselves, first of all and for healing others. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people feel traumatized by their sexual energy, but that's just because it's so incredibly powerful. And when it's misused, it leads to trauma. Mm. But in the same way, that energy can be used for deep, deep, deep healing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I want. That's what I teach. Mm. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much, Naomi. And thank you so much for being here today with us and having oh, this beautiful pleasure. conscious conversation. I'm wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit um, about where they can find you. And I know you have a course that's coming up that you're starting and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. So uh, my website is my name, www.naomislater.com. You can also find me on Instagram, which is Tantra Intimacy Coaching. 
And I do have a course for women coming up. It's a three month online course. It is a deep dive. We'll be doing yoniic practices. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've, of course, mentioned in this uh, beautiful chat that we had, communication, somatic feeling, you know, feeling into our body, creating boundaries, doing deep emotional work, uh, turning on our sensuality for us, first of all, and really stepping into our power, our pleasure, uh, and our passion in life. So that course is launching on May 31st. It's, it's coming up pretty soon. So if you're interested, uh, you can find it on my website. You can find it in my bio, in my Instagram account, um, but definitely reach out. And if you're interested, I will give you all of the details. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. It, it was, was just... really such a special chat. Yes. It was yes. amazing to have share this conscious conversation with you. And we will definitely put your links in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here at Be The Love Podcast, we are excited about our upcoming Awaken Your Soul Costa Rica retreat on November 6th through the 12th, 2023. We would love to have you join us for a beautiful and vibration-raising experience. Check out the webpage with details and registration in the show notes. And thank you for listening to Be The Love Podcast. If you've enjoyed listening to our show, please share the love by sharing it with your family and friends, giving us the five-star written review on iTunes or Spotify, or liking us on Facebook. And please consider supporting our mission to awaken our souls with a monthly donation that really helps us with the operating costs of this podcast so we can continue to spread the love. To contribute, visit our Patreon website at patreon.com forward slash be the love podcast and stay tuned for more episodes being released on Mondays at 5.55 a.m. Mountain Time.